Nové Miesto, Czechoslovakia, 1930s. In rolling hills in the middle of what was then Czechoslovakia, in a province called Moravia, there was a town called Nové Miesto. It wasn't big, but it was famous. And in the winter, especially, it was a very busy place. People from all over the country came to cross-country ski in Nové Miesto. There were races to be raced, there were trails to be blazed, and there were frozen ponds for skating. In the summer, there was swimming, sailing, fishing, and camping. Nove Miesto was home to 4,000 people. Once, the town was well known for making glass. But in the 1930s, people worked in the forests and in little workshops that made skis. On the main street, there was a large, two-story white building. It had a two-story attic. And in its basement, a secret passageway led to a church on the town's main square. In olden days, when the town was under siege by enemies, the passageway was used by soldiers to store food and supplies for the people of Nove Miesto. The town's general store was on the ground floor of the white building. There, you could buy almost anything. Buttons, jam, oil lamps and rakes, sleigh bells, stones for sharpening knives, dishes, paper and pens, and candy. On the second floor lived the Brady family. Father Karl, Mother Marketa, Hannah, and her big brother George. Father worked six days a week in the store. He was an athlete known to almost everyone in Nove Miesto for his love of soccer, skiing, and gymnastics. He was also an amateur actor with a big, booming voice that could be heard from one end of a playing field to the other. Because of this, Father was chosen to call the cross-country ski races over a megaphone so that everyone could hear the action. He was a volunteer firefighter who, with other men from the town, rode the fire engine to help people in emergencies. The Brady family opened their home to artists of all kinds, musicians, painters and poets, sculptors and actors. When they were hungry, they could always find a hot meal produced by Boschka, the family housekeeper and cook. And their artistic talents found an eager audience, which, of course, included two impish children, Hannah and George. Sometimes George was called upon to play his violin. Hannah was more than willing to demonstrate her skill on the piano to anyone who would listen. And in the middle of the living room, there was a record player that was cranked up by hand. Hannah played her favorite song, I Have Nine Canaries, over and over again. Mother was a warm and generous hostess, with a good sense of humor and a very loud laugh. She too worked six days a week in the store, and people often came in just to hear her jokes and banter. She paid special attention to poor people in Nove Miesto, who lived on the outskirts of town. Once a week, she would prepare a bundle of food and clothing that Hannah would deliver to needy neighbors. Hannah was very proud of her mission, and she nagged her mother to make the packages more often. Hannah was a helper in the store, too. From the time they were very small, Hannah and George had the job of keeping the shelves stocked, clean, and tidy. They learned how to slice yeast, chisel small lumps off the sugar loaf, weigh spices and seasonings, and twist paper into the shape of hollow cones to be filled with candy and sold as treats. Once in a while, Mother noticed that some of those candy cones were missing. Hannah never told on George, and he never told on Hannah. There were always cats around the store who worked full-time as mouse catchers. But once, as a special treat, Mother and Father ordered fluffy white Angora kittens as pets for the children. Two soft little bundles arrived through the mail in a box with breathing holes. At first, Silva, the family wolfhound, a huge gray furry creature, sniffed around them suspiciously. 
But soon the kittens, which Hannah named Mickey and Murek, became accepted members of the family. Hannah and George went to the public school. They were average kids who got into regular mischief and had the usual problems and triumphs. There was just one thing that was different about them. The Bradys were Jewish. They weren't a religious family. But mother and father wanted the children to know about their heritage. Once a week, while their playmates were at church, Hannah and George sat with a special teacher who taught them about Jewish holidays and Jewish history. There were a few other Jewish families in Nove Miesto, but Hannah and George were the only Jewish children in the town. In their early years, no one really noticed or cared that they were different. Soon, though, the fact that they were Jews would become the most important thing about them. Tokyo, Winter 2000 Back in her office, half a world away in Japan, and more than half a century later, Fumiko Ishioka remembered how the suitcase had come to her. In 1998, she had begun her job as director of a small museum called the Tokyo Holocaust Center. It was dedicated to teaching Japanese children about the Holocaust. At a conference in Israel, Fumiko had met a few Holocaust survivors, people who had lived through the horrors of the concentration camps. She was astonished by their optimism and their joy in living, despite everything they had been through. When Fumiko felt sad about things in her own life, she often thought about these survivors. They were so strong-willed and wise. They had so much to teach her. Fumiko wanted young people in Japan to learn from the Holocaust as well. It was her job to make that happen. And it wasn't an easy one. How, she wondered, could she help Japanese children understand the terrible story of what happened to millions of Jewish children on a faraway continent over 50 years ago? She decided the best way to start would be through physical objects that the children could see and touch. She wrote to Jewish and Holocaust museums all over the world, in Poland, Germany, the United States, and Israel, asking for a loan of artifacts that had belonged to children. She posted her request on the Internet. She wrote to individuals she thought might be able to help. Fumiko was looking for a pair of shoes and for a suitcase. Everyone turned her down, telling her that the objects they had so carefully preserved were too precious to send to such a small museum so far away. Fumiko wasn't sure what to do next, but she wasn't the kind of person who gave up easily. Just the opposite. The more rejection she got, the more dedicated she became. That fall, Fumiko traveled to Poland, where many Nazi concentration camps had been located. There, on the site of Auschwitz, the most well-known camp, she visited the museum. Fumiko begged for a short meeting with the museum's assistant director. She was given five minutes to explain what she wanted. When she left the assistant director's office, she had a promise that her request would be considered. A few months later, a package from the Auschwitz Museum arrived. A child's sock and shoe, a child's sweater, a can of Cyclone B poisonous gas, and one suitcase. Hannah's suitcase.